Thank you. All right. Thank you guys for coming to our workshop. So uh, this all came together because we did a training this summer that was a six week training on accessibility in OER. And so we had put a cohort together. So this was our group that did that. They had groups from all over the United States, from different um, universities, different higher education institutions that um, did projects. And so what came out of that was we decided to do some workshops and to share some of the things that we learned. So that's what we're gonna do today. It's gonna be kind of just the fundamentals, the basics, and then we'll do some more in-depth stuff as we get further on. So this is the first in a series. We're gonna have another one coming up on October the 25th called Finding OER for Your Course. So I encourage you to sign up for that one. And then we're planning two more in the spring. So keep your eyes out for that. Um, I also wanted to let you know about two other things that are coming up. So I am gonna be facilitating a faculty learning community this year on OER. So if you want to join that, um, the deadline is to apply for that is September the 15th. Or if you know someone in your department that might be interested, please share that with them and encourage you guys to apply. And then also those that are here today or anybody that's online that wants to email me, um, I have an OER listserv to send out information about OER events and trainings and things like that. So people send me uh, your email if you want to sign up for that, I will add you to that list. Okay, so just kind of a quick overview of what we're going to do today. So we're going to start with talking about having an accessibility mindset. And then we're going to go into some steps toward accessibility. And Kim's going to spend probably the bulk of the time going through slide um, explaining that. And those are kind of just some easy things you can do to make your um, OER more accessible. And then we're going to share some resources at the end. We're going to talk about accessibility checkers as well as just some checklists and guides that might be helpful. And then we're hoping we'll have about 15 minutes at the end to kind of give you guys some work time to hopefully if you brought your syllabus or if you have yours pulled up on the computer to give you some time to work on that based on the things that we show you today. Okay, so I thought it was important to start with just kind of the basic understanding of what OER are. So here's a definition from UNESCO. They uh, coined this term actually way back in like 2002. And so the key things in this definition I want to point out are teaching, learning, and research materials. So that can be digital or print, any medium. And they have to either be in the public domain or have been released under an open license. So when we talk about an open license, that's usually mean like a Creative Commons license. Um, if you're not familiar with that, we did a workshop on that back in February that kind of went through all of the Creative Commons uh, licenses and what they are. So if you will go, if you want to check that out, that is on our OER main MTSU OER page, which is mtsu.edu slash OER. It has all of our recordings on there. And then the last part of the definition is um, no cost access, use, adaptation, redistribution by others with limited or no restrictions. So the key things from that are teaching materials, so textbooks, assignments, anything, videos, anything you would use for teaching. And they're open because they have that open license. That's how you know that you can reuse it. You have their permission to do certain things with it. All right, there's also sometimes a misconception or a misunderstanding of OER and free and thinking that they're, they're the same thing. So OER is basically free to access plus gives you the freedom to do the five R's. So let me go quickly through what these five R's are. This is from David Wiley, coined this. Um, I think it was around 2002. So retain, so you can make it on copies of it. Reuse, you can use it in a wide range of ways. Revise, so you can adapt, modify, and improve it, which is that's key what we're talking about today as far as accessibility. If it's an OER, it's licensed where you can go in and revise it. That's where you can go in and, and change things up to, to make it more accessible. Remix, so you can combine it with another OER together. And then finally, redistribute, so you can share it with others. And so people sometimes say, well, how do I know when I can do these things? Well, that's when you want to look at the license, and that's what's going to give you the permission to do that. Okay, so we're going to jump to 
having an accessibility mindset. We're going to talk about why it matters and how we want to start from the beginning. So one of the main goals of open textbooks is that they can be accessed by more people with fewer barriers. So it just makes sense that we want to do accessibility best practices when we're making OER. Um, one thing that I want to talk about is um, the importance of having an accessibility mindset from the beginning. And so that's thinking about from the beginning, how can I make this accessible? Um, and why is that? Why that matters is because one thing that they really stressed in our training was accessibility benefits everyone. It may be something that was specifically designed because of someone that had a disability, but it, in, in the end, it benefits everyone. So, for example, um, how many people like to use closed captions? You know, how many people I do all the time when I'm home? How many people, when you watch a webinar, it's handy to have a transcript to go along to follow along with that? When you're walking into Walmart, do you appreciate that the door is open automatically for you? <laughs> you know, all these things were made specifically for people with disabilities, but because of that, we all benefit. So that's the same thing with what we're going to think about um, when we're thinking about accessibility for our uh, course materials. And then I wanted to share this definition of accessibility that I found really helpful. So this came from the AIM Center, and they define it as accessibility is when a person with a disability can acquire the same information, engage in the same interactions, enjoy the same services in an equally effective, equally integrated manner with substantially equivalent ease of use as the person without a disability. So for me, that broke it down real clear to understand all the different pieces of that. But I also think sometimes when I look at this definition as an instructor, that might be a little scary to think of like, how am I going to do that? How am I going to make it equally effective, equally integrated? So we want to stress today that accessibility is a journey. There's no way you can be perfect with accessibility 100% of the time. So we're going to show you some simple steps to start with. So don't get stressed about thinking, oh, all my materials have to be completely accessible right now. We're going to start where you're at and just show you some small steps to take. And those small things are going to have a big impact in the end. So. The next part is we're going to jump, we're going to let Kat talk for a minute about uh, universal design for learning. Universal design for learning is near and dear to my heart. I'm an elementary educator. And um, to key back on something that Janelle shared, when we think of keeping everyone in mind with accessibility. And so a simple definition of UDL is a flexible framework based on science and research that educators can use to proactively design learning to increase success for all. And to me, this is so important from the onset to begin with the end in mind. And I have been teaching at university level for almost 23 years now. I know I started when I was 14. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I could only access textbooks that were read aloud for students who had disability and access um, paperwork completed. And by using OER, my students who just prefer to listen, and we are now teaching a generation of podcast listening students, they prefer many times to listen to their their textbooks or any type of article that we're having them read. And so if I find open education resources that are accessible, my students don't need to go through the Disability and Access Office to access that document. And then my students who just prefer that particular mode. Um, so thinking about how to create documents with the ease of access for everyone. That's just um, my favorite part of working on this team for uh, the last couple of months and making those small changes in my classroom. And so I have a wonderfully accessible syllabus, except for my calendar, <laughs> because I share too much information in my calendar and I can't squeeze it in. 
So I have been working with my graduate students to make my calendar, just a tiny part of my syllabus, accessible so that it is accessible for all. And the student who brought it up to me was like, Dr. Cat, you're the first professor who has given us an accessible syllabus. And this literally happened last week. And I was like, yes. And she goes, but there's one part that's not accessible. And I was like, oh, do tell, knowing full that it was the calendar that I just copied and pasted inside um, because our department prefers us to have the calendar for the semester in the syllabus when we submit it to the chair. But um, I was like, yes, do tell. And this particular student has not filed with DAC. She just prefers certain types of accommodations. All right. So next, we're going to talk about steps towards accessibility. And this is a great, easy way to remember. We're going to slide into accessibility with Dr. Kim Godwin. Thank you. And you can find her now in the College of Ed. <laughs> yes, we can. And that was where I am now. Uh, so SLIDE is the acronym that is used for the five key areas of thinking about accessibility when you're creating documents, uh, reviewing resources, or thinking about how you're going to make things more accessible for your students. So I'm going to go through each one of these a little bit um, and tell you what each one of them is. So um, I guess we will send out this PowerPoint so people can have it later, but active link. So we'll actually show you um, a little bit about where it talks about SLIDE through the CAST and um, the uh, AIM Center and getting that information out there. So what STYLES is, is STYLES is about um, your section headings. So when you are in a Word document, so those of you that have technology in front of you, um, if you have a Word document open, you can go into that and up at the top, there's gonna be a little section that it, it's on the home page. And it's um, a little bigger. Uh, and it gives you a, a it's like the fifth or sixth one over that gives you the styles option. And that's where things like heading, heading two, title, subtitle, emphasis, italic, all of those things. So my guess is, is that for a long time in your documents, you've been bolding things or italicizing things from the cute little B uh, and then the slanted italicized I. And then, oh, there's a U that has a little underline under it that means underline. So you've probably been using those for a really, really long time. Uh, those are not actually accessible if someone is using a screen reader to view the information. Um, so what you'll wanna do when you are looking at your documents is go to that next section over that talks about the styles and it talks about the headings. And that's where you will actually set up your um, your structure so that your top is a title and then a heading one and then a heading two. And A, that helps you because it, it breaks up your document and people can actually collapse sections if they're done with them. Uh, it will actually bookmark the sections for people that are using screen readers. Um, and then it will also help with um, if they are using, um, if they are a no mouse person and they are only using tab, or spacebar or arrows on their keyboard, um, or they are using a device that they have to move um, with their mouth or some other um, part of the body that is not uh, use of a mouse. and makes it so they can go through the document without ending up all over the place. And it's saying things like bold, blue. It actually just tells you that it what it is and that it's important. Um, so, those are just some things to think about with style, and we'll go over that a little more when we actually look at the syllabus here in just a second. Um, links. So um, links, this is one of my, my favorite ones to talk about, links in a document. So for a really long time, the way that we put links in a document was that we either just copied and pasted the URL and just dropped it in there, and it was 11 gazillion letters and symbols long, and it just took up a whole page. Um, that is the official number, just 11, 11 million, million. Uh, is a million of them. And so when you're looking at that from your own perspective, if you are a sighted person, you see all those letters and numbers and you're like, well, that's silly um, because it's really, really long. If you are a not sighted person and you are using a screen reader, it literally will read back to you HTTPS colon slash slash 
www.mtsu.edu slash OER slash and go on for the entire length of whatever that URL is. Um, all 11 gazillion letters that are in it. So there's a couple of things that you'll want to think about in terms of links. I think you really do want to fix that. Um, you don't want students to have to see that. So um, there's a couple of different ways you'll address it. Uh, you can either embed the link in the word, the descriptive word that you're talking about. So if you're sending them to the MTSU website, you can type in MTSU website and then link in the link to itself to the word by clicking the link button up in your word document um one of the key things to think about with that try not as much as you can to say click here and activate that link because that's not a description to someone who is listening to the document being read to them they don't know what click here means and they don't know where it's taken um so you, it, it could be going anywhere and that's a little suspicious in today's world to just randomly get sent to a website that you don't know where you're going. So make sure that you actually say what the description of that website is when you are linking students to it. You can also use the secondary option, which is to create a bit.ly, um, which is a short URL. You can just Google bit.ly and it will show you how to do that. You can get free access to it and then it will take that 11 gazillion letter URL and shrink it down to like eight. Um, so that's another way that you can look at doing that with links. Images. The option with images is um, if you are cited, you can see what's in the image. If you are not, and there are images in your documents and they are just staring back at you uh, and you are not a cited person, you have no idea what that is. It literally will just say image. And it typically is whatever's auto-generated from the internet from where you copied and pasted it into your document, which probably wasn't OER, but that's a whole different, we'll talk about that later. Um, you want to make sure that you have the alt text behind your image. That gives a, an individual the ability to know what is in that image. Um, think about what you're putting in there. Um, so if you're putting images in just because you want images, you need to alt text all of them. So this especially becomes really common in PowerPoints that I've seen in people's classes, um, that they just put a whole bunch of just like clip art individual things in there, like icons that are out there. You have to go in and describe every single one of those. Now, at the same point, don't have something that doesn't have any. You want to have some images in your things, but don't put them in there just for the point of putting them in there. Uh, so you want to put alt text in for each image that you put into anything. Um, if you look at some of the accessible syllabi that are offered through the provost office or MTSU online um, or ITD, you will see that the MTSU logo that is at the top has an alt text behind it. So if you run an accessibility checker, it won't pop up unless you have a really old one. Um, and then we'll show you how to fix that in a little bit. Um, so that's what you want to do with that. Be descriptive enough that it would be explained to someone. So if it's a group of, of six people, you can say it's a group of six people sitting around a table having a conversation, uh, mix of genders, ages, ethnicities, races, however you want to describe it, but enough that someone who can't see it will know what it is and why it's in there. That applies not only to images that you put in there, but if you take a table or a chart that you borrow from someplace to put into uh, a document or a PowerPoint or something like that, you need to alt text that too, or at least describe it in your caption that goes under it to the point that someone who cannot see it would be able to know what it was that it was talking about. Um, because that's one of the things we run into a lot is when we, we run a report, we create something, um, SPSS spits out some cute pie chart for us, and we just copy and paste it into our document or into our slides. That's great. Uh, if you are a sighted individual, you can see what that is. If you are not, when you get to that slide or you get to that point in the document, it's just a blank page. It's just an unknown image. Um, and so you're really kind of setting students up a little bit to not be as successful because if you then ask about that chart in a test or an assessment at a later point, 
that student doesn't know what was in it because that information wasn't there for them. Um, design, that's about making sure that you have um, contrast in your coloring of your text and things like that. So um, making sure that if it's a, a white background that you're using dark text, if it's a dark background, you're using light colored text and that your texts have enough variance that people would be able to see. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever had uh, something that got sent to you that was, the background was in light gray and the words were in like a light yellow. That's, you can't see that. You have no idea what that is. Um, now imagine if you're somebody that had visibility issues or you're somebody who was colorblind, um, or something like that, that's not going to work out very well because they're not going to see it. Um, so in the same way with that, um, in terms of colors, be very conscious about the color choices that you're making because of colorblindness um, and how that works out. And then evaluation with slide is about making sure that you're looking at it as a whole um, and touching on all of those big components. Um, and one of the things that I didn't mention earlier, and it's actually pretty important, is when I said the U with the underline underneath it, that we use that, don't, uh, please don't use that because what an underline means is that it is an, it's a URL. Um, so if you underline something, someone may have go and start trying to click on something that doesn't go anywhere. So don't use underline as your way of designating importance and emphasizing something. If you're using those styles, it's gonna show within those different heading categories. Um, and there's a way on everything to do um, an accessibility checker uh, in all of the Microsoft programs. It's under the review tab. It just says check accessibility and you click a little button and it does it. And then it tells you all the things that you did correctly on the right hand side. Um, or incorrectly, but I was sitting on my way. Do you need to pause it over? Okay. Does anyone have questions about slides before we move forward? So at what point do you think you'll see AI come in and help make things accessible? So we've seen AI writing songs now with, you know, like if you see anything on the horizon there that would help folks make sure they are designing with accessibility in mind? So yes. Um, so I don't see it happening in something like chat GPT or something like that that's creating the document. Uh, but they actually, uh, your documents and your information are actually smart enough that once you set up your initial um, accessibility from your first page, it will carry it through to your other pages because um, it has that smart style in it. It probably drives you crazy because the auto formatting mm -hmm. that you want to turn off when you're creating a new document or a new resource, don't. What it's trying to do is make sure that you are formatting it correctly based on what you did initially. So that is actually the AI of Microsoft that is doing that. Yeah, that's somebody just open and close it. Uh, and it's gonna pick it up, it's a fancy microphone. Sorry. All right, what other questions? Are there any questions in the chat? I don't see them. Oh. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry, man. I just that's fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to talk about what she just said about accessibility checkers. So, two that we know about. So, in Word, you know, what she just said, you just need to go to review and then go to check accessibility. There's also one in Adobe. So, if you have Adobe Pro, you go under tools and then action wizard, and then it has a make accessible thing that you put there. And the, just the point of that is they just drilled this with us is always run the checker. You know, it's not going to be perfect. It's not going to catch everything, but it's a good start. Always just get in the habit of doing that. Um, as far as I know right now, Google Docs does not have accessibility checker, which you would think they should be on that right now. But yeah, they do not have one. Okay, I just wanted to share real quick three resources that I found helpful. And the first one is from um, MTSU Online. has this handy little... Um, creating accessible content list. And so I'll just show you for an example of a few of these here. So she talked about images. So if you want to remind yourself about that, here's a little quick, you know, summary of things you want to think about when you're looking at images. It goes into the alt, the alt description. Another, here's the one about links. So make sure the link text is descriptive. 
And it gives you an example. For example, contact the Disability and Access Center. There's the link. So this is, if you want to have a summary later to go back to as you're looking through items, this list is really helpful. It also goes into things like colors, fonts, um, and specifically if you had a question about PowerPoint, there's things there. So this will be uh, linked in the, the slides that we sent out, and they're also linked in the second thing I'm going to show you. This is an infographic that, that Kim made as part of our... Uh, I think it's open all the way. Let's see. I don't think it's going to be able to do this open here. But anyway, we'll send you the link to this. So this talks just about the, the basics of what we talked about today. Of what is accessibility? Um, why is it important? And it gives you some links to some examples of uh, accessible syllabi. And then lastly, this is one that I liked. Um, I'm a checklist person. I know a lot of people are anti-checklist, <laughs> but I like to have something that I can go through. I don't know if it's just the, li the library part of me that likes order and things. But so this came from the accessibility toolkit, and I'll show you what that looks like. This is something that's um, was put together by the BC campus um, accessibility toolkit, their second edition. And at the very end in their appendix, they have this checklist. And so it just gives you a real quick thing to check for as far as how it's organized. You know what Kim talked about headings and subheadings goes into images, links, tables, and different things about multimedia and fonts. So if you like to go through and to have something to check off, that is a handy little um, checklist to, to have there. Okay. Okay, so now we're just going to have Kim's going to kind of walk you through. Sure. Yeah. And actually, she's saying maybe you want to open the chat. Sure. Oh, yeah, we got two chats. Okay. So let me scroll down. Scroll down. Here we go. Scroll down. Yeah, this one. Okay. You may have touched on my captions. Sometimes the YouTube captions have errors, but you can't go in and edit them. Is it okay to use the video anyway? as long as the error is not important um, to the content that you want students to get. Yeah, I'm, I've done some of YouTube. You might have something else to say about that. Uh, so, sure. Uh, sure. <laughs> yeah. It, as long as someone in the course where you're using that YouTube video does not need an accommodation, then the auto captioning, even with minimal errors, is okay. Um, especially if those errors are not specific to the content. Um, for a very long time, YouTube thought that every time I said MTSU online, I was saying empty sushi line. Um, <laughs> hey, that's everyone's dream. I mean, that's not good. I need some sushi. Um, and no waiting. It, like the heat. They finally figured it out and started correcting it. Um, the AI got better, I guess, where I learned how to enunciate it. I'm not really sure. Um, so if it's not hugely important it's okay make sure that in your description when you are putting the information out there about the video that you are adding the statement that it is auto caption and has not been edited for accuracy um, if someone comes into your course that needs a full accommodation you will need to go back in and update it you can update youtube transcripts um, there is a way to do it um, through your owner capacities and creator capacities of the content it's not super easy um, so one of the things and this isn't on any of our stuff but it's it's really helpful uh, if you got the mtsu online newsletter like a couple weeks ago i'm sure that you all read it from beginning to end, but there is definitely this, I mean, right? Yeah, six or seven times, backwards and forwards. Um, there is a section in it that talks about captioning and some of the better ways to do that. Um, and I'm okay if this gets recorded, but Panopto's cap captioning is, it's tragic. Um, it's really <laughs> not good. Um, so one of the things that you can kind of look at, a lot of times people have taken their Panopto downloaded the mp4 uploaded it to youtube and let youtube do the auto captioning so right. a, a That's faster right. and better way to do that is when you download your mp4 and it doesn't have to be Pinocchio, but any mp4 video that you save save it to your OneDrive. you know you all have OneDrive as a faculty member um save it to a OneDrive folder 
and then click it open. Don't open it in the app. Literally just click on it so it goes onto the preview screen. And then in the top right corner, there's a video effects button. If you push that, go down like three or four. One of them is generate transcripts. Mm -hmm. And it will auto-generate your transcript for you. It is a Microsoft AI software, which means it is global uh, and is one of the best ones I've ever seen. Um, it typically even is able to figure out um, accents, um, it, even non-native speakers. Uh, it's able to really do a great job at that. And once it's done generating it for you, you can download it and upload it as a um, as a transcript if you want to, or you can. Um, it will automatically save the captions into that MP4 right there, and then you can load that into wherever you need to put it with the captions already attached. Um, but it's also because it's Microsoft and it's right there. You just click the button and it opens, and you edit your captions right there. So it's very easy to edit your captions if you need to make sure your captions are accurate. So Anne is asking, what about third party videos? You have fine ones that are already captioned. Yeah. And if they're not, you shouldn't use them. Mm -hmm. uh, or ask them if they have a transcript or are willing to turn on their auto captioning. Most people will turn it on. They just didn't think about that they needed to. Um, and uh, most things that are more current, people are automatically turning them on. But if they're older than a couple of years, you usually have to reach out to the owner and ask them to turn it on. Most people will. And even if it's on, you, she cannot edit. I think her, the question yeah. is, she cannot she edit. She can't edit somebody else's. So somebody would need to do a transcript um, and edit the transcript, so. Okay, yeah. and did we get your, did you get your answer? Did that help, Ann? I'm looking at the <laughs> screen. Like, she said yes. That's fantastic, like the camera's not on at all, you don't need to see anything. She said yes. <laughs> okay. Yes, but Stephanie sees you. I know what Stephanie. Yeah, yeah, everybody here sees me. And I'm like, did that answer the question? The LP, the LP, and, and ITC stays in the LT. <laughs> it says it is what it ordered, and we'll go on the OER website later. So everybody's going to go into it. Um, okay, we were going to talk about syllabi. So this is a chance to kind of work through your syllabi. Um, I am going to click on the undergrad syllabus. Um, and kind of walk y'all through. So go ahead and open up your own. If you have it digitally, if you're on Zoom, you probably have it digital. I would suspect you were using a device at some point. That's a good question. Um, so you'll go ahead and open it, take a look at it. Yeah. This is the um, undergrad syllabus accessible. Uh, it can be found, um, I think it's on the Provost website. I know it's on the MTSU Online Faculty Resources website. Um, and if you teach an online class, it was auto-dropped into your class before your class was given to you. Um, so use this as your template. Um, feel free to update it as necessary for your own college or department because you are going to have things that need to do specific um, but as you're looking at this, this document, what you can kind of see, there's the MTSU image at the top. And if you um, look at the different layers, these are blue, um, which that is just the settings that we're in. But these are actually set in there as headings. Um, so the style structure is already in place on this. So what I have learned in my now two and a half weeks is back in number um, is that um, we are very good as uh, users copying and pasting. Um, we like to be like, oh, I already have it. I'll just drop it in there. I'll just copy paste. Great. I fully support copy paste, except if you already have a heading structure and a styles in your document, if you copy paste, it will override the styles that are in there. So the way that you fix that is that you can either right click and paste text only, which is paste as plain text, um, and that will keep the formatting. Or if you are someone who likes to do things a little bit less right clicky, it's a uh, control 
Alt V to paste. Now, I don't own a Mac, so, and I don't know how to use a Mac other than the fact that I hear lots of people have Apple products. So I don't actually know what the control all, I'm, y'all, Claire just clutched her pearls. Yeah, I know, right? Her friend just did. Um, so I don't know what the control all is for Mac, but if you right click, it should actually tell you. Macs are really good about telling you what the codes are to make things work. Um, or if someone knows, you want to put in the chat, let us know. We'll add it to our information. Um, okay, so as you're looking at yours um, and you're looking at your syllabi, if yours isn't already structured with the headings, the way that you're going to get to your headings is up at the top. It's the, if you're using your, um, the app, I mean, if you're using the browser as opposed to the app, if you're using the browser, you'll scroll over to the one that has the A with the little paintbrush that is a little over halfway over. If it is, if you opened it as a document, it's there, but it may actually show up, uh, depending on how big your screen is, it may show up as the, the open box that actually says things like heading, heading two. It may actually say that. Um, so um, just know that that's what you're looking. So if yours doesn't have headings, you're going to want to go through and select your heading. So you're going to want to label the course name and number as the most important heading on your document. So you're probably going to want to make that heading one. Title is one you really don't use a whole lot because it is huge. <laughs> um, I can show you how big it is. Um, title is real good. Um, yeah, I never so I tend to not use title for anything. I tend to start with heading one. Um, and then you'll do heading one for your course and title and maybe your number of credits. That depends on you and your needs. You may want to make that one smaller. Uh, and then when you start with instructor information, go ahead and switch it to heading two. Um, and then with each sub, from there. So if your primary categories are heading two, then your secondary categories would be a heading three. So um, in here, your course information one, this it's really up to you if it's heading one or heading two, you decide how you want it to look. But if this one is heading two, then the description right underneath it would be heading three. And then you would go from there. So as you go through your document, so objectives would be heading three, topics covered is three. I don't know if there's any additional subs in here. They're probably just going to be heading one and heading two. Um, but that is how you do the headings. Um, and it really, it takes a minute the first time that you do it. But once you set it up, you can use the same one over and over again and just change that information as long as you're using the paste this plain text option. It is okay to use charts and tables no, uh, in your syllabi as long as they are accessible. Um, and in order for them to be accessible, you need to have header rows and you need to have um, background information. So it may be easier to just type them out yes. um, unless you want to use one that's already built. So if you have one like these in our example one, um, it's already built. So you can just go in there and just update the content that's in there and just use these because these are accessible. I am going to show y'all, hopefully this one is actually correct, because um, that would be great if it's not. I'm going to show y'all the accessibility checker. It's probably going to be messed up. Um, you'll go to review across the top, and then you click check accessibility, and you, oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and you celebrate because it says there are no accessibility issues found. Uh, people with disabilities should not have difficulty reading this content. Yes, yes. I was going to ask if you would check the very first page for the MTSU logo and see if it has been alt texted. On this argument? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, it should have been since it didn't show up, but let's see what it says. 92%. And then, yeah, that's my editor. Clearly something not spelled correctly. I don't 
think it is. Is it on? Why won't there's it's under picture alt text? I always use the document and not the I always use the right click so I never know. Yeah. yeah. What's it say? Oh, there it is. MTSU Ooh. logo. There it's it's there. MTSU logo is the title and the description is MTSU logo centered at the top of the page. That's fancy. Yeah. So when I was talking about your alt text needs to be descriptive. We didn't have to be like, it is Middle Tennessee in black font with the blue swishy line and then State University also in black and in a smaller font, all caps. We don't have to do that. It can be the MTSU logo centered in the top um, because that gets the point across as to what the student is looking at when it is giving it to them in a screen reader format. So yeah, this one's on point. On point. Yeah. Um, what questions? Can you alter like something that is wrong and walk us through yes. the checker to see how to see what it does? Yes, what it says and how to know where to go. Oh, make something not accessible. Exactly. Is this like a is this one that's saved from like one of our own private folders or is it the universal one from the website? Oh, it's so whichever one you put on the oh, infograph. Okay. All right, so you might want to open a different one. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> like that's all I need is to be the one that messes up the one that's on the MTSU website. Yeah, as a reminder, when in doubt, if you see that it's a OneDrive, go ahead and download a copy before you start editing it because you may actually be editing the one that is the <laughs> campus document. Um, so go ahead and download a copy to get started so that you don't have that. Um, and you wanted me to mess something up, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so that's really quick and easy, but I just copied and pasted. I, I copied the stuff under description and I pasted it up at the top. I did not use all the plain text ones, so it erased all of our headings that were structured in there. Um, that is how fast and easy it is to mess up the heading structures. Y'all saw where the alt text is. So if you want to update an alt text, click on the picture. And then if you're in it at, in the browser, go to the picture tab and then go to alt text and you can enter all the information that way. If you are in it as um, a document, like you open the document up on your device, not through the web browser, but as the app, then you can right click and it will open the alt text and you can enter the information from there. So Kim, if you take the alt text out, can you show what it what it does when you run the checker? I can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, we now have an error it says that we have a missing object description uh, the great thing about the way these checkers work is that I can just simply click on that little arrow and it will tell me where the issue is it says it's with picture two um, and then you can go into your picture two go into your picture two do your alt text Right, so that is in there now, and we can recheck and see if that fixed our problem. So. Yay! Um, so it fixed our problem. Um, so if you're using the browser and when you're setting a document, this may be just a, a me preference, but when you're setting up a document or creating a new document, I actually recommend doing it in the app, not the browser, um, because the app, um, I don't know if y'all saw, but when I was putting it in there, I had to go to different tabs to get to the one that was alt text. If you're in the app from the actual accessibility checker, it will let you correct it right there. 
um, you can just click on it and you can say fix and it will open up what you need to have open to fix it. So if you are creating a new document or you're doing one that you haven't done before, I actually do recommend opening it in the app and not in the browser because it's just a little bit easier for you. You don't have to keep going back and forth between different tabs. It's all right there on one tab. What, what question do you have questions more I think John want to see? No, do you otherwise? Um, I can show you some URLs that are in here. That's very hard. Yeah, we do. So, you know, this is in here now. The use of AR generated. Um, it's in the sample syllabus now. So, just in case anybody wants it, it's there. Is it is it approved? Yeah, it's the sample sample syllabus. Oh, Here, okay. it's sample syllabus. It's not the provost approved syllabus. It's the here's potential wording in case you want to add something that is a statement, but it's not the official university approved statement yet. So Kim, I have, I have a question. I know for this type, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, slide is all of these steps. For this style, if you mess the style. Does the checker give you an error and, and tell you like what to do? Can you show us? Yeah, like here when you messed with the style, mm -hmm. the instructor information and all of that. All right. Watch, oh, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna be like, just kidding. <laughs> yeah, it says it's okay. Now, if you were to open it up in the app, it would tell you it was wrong. Or if you were to PDF it, it would tell you it was wrong. Um, so that's one of the drawbacks sometimes that versions of Word don't get it because it's not necessarily. If I change it, part of it is probably because I did title and title. Um, and if you, because the document itself is structured with multiple heading one, heading two, heading three, I would have to go through and change them all throughout for it to recognize that that wasn't an accurate order. Um, because it's okay with it that you're changing because there's several times in there that you had heading one or heading two or heading three already. Um, if you were to save it as a PDF and put it, and then do your checker on it, it would yell at you loudly for doing this. Um, and it's hard to change headings in PDFs. So if you're going to PDF your documents, your syllabus, other documents for a class, fix them in Word first, um, because it is a thousand times easier than trying to fix it in a PDF. I help you at all because I didn't do it. So I'll have a little bit of this. Switch on the PDF. What other questions do y'all have that we may have? So for me, always at the end, I want to make sure people have a chance to basically do some myth busting, you know? Mm -hmm. So maybe the top con misconceptions about OER and just get them out of there, just eliminate them from the experts' feed right now. People think it's not rigorous. Um, and, and rigor is an academic made up concept anyway. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, second week on the job. Second week on the job. <laughs> if who determines rigor, that's what I mean by that. It could be different for every level, for every college, for every institution, for every department, for every everything. What rigor is is different. Um, I know, right? I'm not going to get tenure and security because that statement right there and it's recorded forever. Um, so, 
But that is the one I hear the most is that people tell me it's not academically rigorous and so they can't use it. Um, and, and while yeah, there are some things that are out there that were created by people who have no idea what they're talking about, a lot of the things that are out there are created by other academics. Experts. Experts. People who you probably even discuss in your classes have created podcasts or videos or articles or resources or things that are out there. Well, it, because it's free, it's no longer rigorous. Um, I think that's the one that I hear the most that I'm like, but that that person was your faculty member when you were in college. Are you saying that person doesn't know what they're talking about? Um, which maybe they don't, but I'm not here to judge that. Um, so that's the one that I hear the most. It's the most frustrating for me is that it, it's not rigorous enough. What about the rest of the team? You know, biggest misconception we need to just get rid of related to OER. I, I would say just because something is available online doesn't make it OER. Uh -huh. Good. Um, there's a lot of stuff that's published through um, well-known publishers, um, Cengage, uh, Pearson, that require subscriptions, and those are not OER. Just because it is on a ebook or a electronic platform doesn't make it an open education resource. That's a huge misconception. Mm -hmm. Another thing I think it's that they think it takes a lot of time, so why should I do it? Um, I think it does take time, but it is for the greater good. That is why we chose this profession. And once you do it the first time, I think it becomes really easier um, to adopt it. And there's different levels of like Correct. adoption. Some of the, someone else has already made it. Mm -hmm. You just have to find it. Mm -hmm. All the way people think, oh, I, it means I have to start from scratch and mm -hmm. write a whole book. You don't have to. People Correct. can do that, but there's a whole range of, of OER mm -hmm. as far as adoption to creation. All right. Yeah. I agree. OER is like a zero gravity entry pool. You just keep walking in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. That first grant that the university got like three years ago that everybody's like, I'm going to build my own book. I'm totally going to write my own book. And a lot of people did. And that is a lot, a lot of work. Um, but going out, there may actually already be one out there that is freely available uh, through any of the OER textbook sites. Um, and that's one of the ones I think too that runs into the can it be adopted, can it be used, how are we utilizing the information, and then how do we know that it is rigorous enough? Well, if it was created by faculty at Minnesota, can we assume that they are also academically <laughs> credentialed appropriately to teach at their institution and therefore might be experts in their field? Not from Florida. But no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Also, you could actually use this as an assignment too, where students, after maybe halfway through class, they're like, okay, go find some complimentary OER sources that you feel match what we've read so far, or something like that. Like, put them on a scavenger hunt type of thing to find quality, high quality OER. And then, of course, you just build a possible out of those things. But I think it'd be a unique challenge to ask the students to be involved in, in that, maybe. And I think the faculty should be responsible too, because we are experts in what we are teaching, right? So we are also like can be judges of the quality or the rigorous of whatever we're gonna include in our class, right? And we'll talk about that more in the, the next workshop. It's gonna be about finding OER and it'll go into the evaluation part of it. Mm -hmm. um, and make sure you show the link to the, to the poll, the survey. Um, we guys have a very short survey we'd like you guys to take so that we can kind of get an idea of what you want to know more about as far as accessibility goes. Um, see, I used a bit late. Um, <laughs> I used a bit late. If somebody could put that in the chat, that would be helpful to share with the people that are on Zoom. Um, this will help us kind of th think about what you guys want in future workshops. Broken. These are broken. I think our time is up.
according to Brian's <laughs> <No. laughs> Not putting the bit.ly in the chat, and y'all can see what I mean by the length of the URL versus what's a bit. So like. the, we have that message before we. Uh, is there anyone you would recommend we talk to who can check the accessibility of our OER text materials? Uh, the, is there someone in the DIC? The DAC might have somebody, the Disability Access Center, um, or the Center for Technology and Teaching, Teaching and Technology, formerly known as the FITSI, the CTT. Um, Sherry or Jennifer? CTT? Yes. C. Center for Teaching and Technology. I think that's what it's named. Is that what it's called now? Jennifer or what? For the formerly known as the Fitzy. Jennifer or Sherry? C H E R I. Sherry Wolf. Sherry Wolf. Sherry Wolf. She's actually an accessibility person through ITD, so she might be a really good person to reach out to. Okay. Thank you all so much Thank for you. spending your lunch time with us. Thank you. Thank you all our speakers. Thank you. <laughs> See you in October. Yes. <laughs>